On February 20th, 1996, a popular Australian Christian rock band called the Newsboys dropped the hit song Breakfast, a song that strangely enough cheerfully mourns a deceased friend of the band by honoring his love for breakfast food. This song currently has over 6.6 .6 million streams on Spotify, which indicates that even 10 years after the release of this song, it still has remained a fairly popular track when compared to the rest of their 90s discography. Today, the Newsboys unfortunately don't really fit within the boundaries of most of the musical genres they stumble into, but 28 years ago, they were topping charts with this specific song for a quarter of the year. If we look a little closer, the lyrics of the song feel really out of touch despite a pretty catchy melody. The point of this entire song though was not just to pay respects to a dead guy who ate a ton of cereal. The greater picture being painted was that if you aren't going to heaven, you better know that Singing and writing lyrics about the lack of cereal and skim milk in any afterlife is really bizarre. This nearly three decade old song plays a vital role in the topic of today's video. When people talk about what lies ahead after we kick the bucket, it's pretty rare to speculate on whether or not you can share a bowl of cinnamon toast crunch with Jesus. Most religious people are just concerned whether or not they're gonna make it to heaven of some sort in the first place. Regardless of any personal belief, it's fascinating to speculate on what things could potentially exist both here on earth as well as in the afterlife. If we look at this specific chorus lyric, at least me to believe in two things. Cereal is not found in hell, but more likely found in heaven. Secondly, if heaven is real, Captain Crunch probably has a one-way ticket there along with other popular brand mascots. This personification of my favorite childhood cereal mascot was a profound concept to my seven-year-old brain at the time. I didn't understand the messaging of the song in first grade, but I did understand that Captain Crunch is delicious, and I certainly didn't want to die and never get to taste Crunch Berries again. The newsboys of old have inspired me to take a daring journey into quantifying the life of not just Captain Crunch, but of other famed brand characters too. Is it strange to dive into a world of belief where the Honey Nut Cheerios B could greet me at the pearly gates? Yeah, a, a little. But if a 90s Christian rock band can make a God-themed breakfast song, I sure as hell can figure out what it would take to send one of these mascots directly to their maker. And what better way for us to figure that out than for me to fight them myself. As an adult, it's pretty easy for me to go into a Target, buy a family-sized box of Captain Crunch, and tear through that shit like a malnourished raccoon. What's not easy is trying to size this dude up in a metaphysical realm of combat. For some context, fighting assorted brand mascots became a pretty viral meme a few years ago. The idea stemmed from a Reddit post that then took off after several popular YouTubers ran with the format. But I am not a popular YouTuber, and I'm not just fighting them. I'm gonna try to destroy them. One of the most important aspects of any game or sport is understanding who you're exactly going up against. You need to understand your opponent's strengths, weaknesses, and abilities before you rush into battle. This is why it's vital for us to do a little research not just on Captain Crunch, but on any potential opponent I intend on sending directly to their demise. We need to level the playing field and give everybody the same basis to track how close somebody can be to elimination and how durable they are. My solution to this is to assign an HP stat to every single brand mascot and to assign an HP stat to myself as well. If you're unfamiliar to any games that calculate and quantify HP, all you need to know is that HP stands for hit points. Characters of all different shapes, sizes, and strength have varying HP stats. Pokemon is a great example of a game that utilizes hit points as the basis for determining life and death because each individual Pokemon has a unique HP stat. Some of these stats range from, yeah, that makes sense, all the way to, how the hell does this fish have more HP than God? To make things easy for us, we're not gonna worry about stats like attack and defense. Instead, we'll go based on a more subjective approach based on the typing and body composition of each individual to determine an all-encompassing HP stat. I'll touch more on that in just a second because there's a more important question at hand. How do we even calculate real life HP stats? There's an excellent video by Brian David Gilbert in Polygon that goes into great detail about how to calculate your own pet's HP. I'm going to simplify their formula by using a modified version to easily calculate the HP stats of today's subjects. We don't really have any methodology to track specific behaviors or determine the skill sets of any of the characters in the video, which is why a one-size-fits-all mentality is best for the sake of this content. To start to fill out our simplified equation, we need to first understand something's typing and then its body composition. Typing is going to be defined by the category seen in the previous video, and we'll use the same Pokemon for simplicity's sake. I did make a note that there is not a human category yet, and so we need to add one. I was a little worried on how I was going to figure this out, but surprisingly, there's actually a category of human-like Pokemon which allows us to find the low lowest base and highest max hit points out of these 70 Pokemon. After doing some quick math, we have our human HP range as well as a congruent model that doesn't give any typing an overwhelming advantage and most importantly puts me on a level playing field. Next up is figuring out composition. This one is much less complicated and will be determined based on four basic body types. Weak, 
average, jacked, and superhuman. Depending on which category a character falls into, you'll be within a range of HP derived from your overall typing. For example, if you're a weak plant like Mr. Peanut, your HP range can only be from the base level to 30% of the max HP for your typing. Once you've determined your strength, we then will take into account a standard bell curve for your typing's height, and depending on how many standard deviations you are from the average, that will assign you your final HP. Let's use me for example to see how the system works. I'm a male human at 5 feet 11 inches, and I have an average strength level. The average male height is about 5 foot 9, which means I clock in just about one standard deviation above the average male height. Plug in some pretty simple math, and that leaves me with 190 HP. Not a bad start by any means, but we're about to enter the ring with a ton of different brand mascots. Let's bring our first character out into the battlefield and see what happens. The thought of pulverizing this annoyingly charming green owl will either bring happiness or immense rage depending on who you ask. And between these two camps of people, it's also pretty split online trying to determine how tall the Duolingo owl is. We know that Duo is definitely a bird type, and he'll probably fall under the average category because while he may be an expert at working other languages, it's undetermined if he's an expert at lifting weights. Nonetheless, there are images that have circulated around social media depicting Duo as tall as 7 foot 9, but other corners of the internet say he's not even 4 centimeters tall. I'll venture to say that Duo is probably the size of an average owl, about two feet tall. I know some people will argue that the most popular version of Duo people see is this giant plush version of him, but that's like saying that this Pikachu costume accurately depicts the size of him in game. We want a canonically accurate Duolingo. The bird typing can have an HP stat that ranges from 40 to 414. Think hummingbird to ostrich. These opposite ends of the bird type range from two to 110 inches. That means the median bird size is an impressive 4 foot 8, but that's not going to bode well for Duo. He'll be falling pretty much at the back end of the average bird category, giving him roughly 125 HP. This may seem like I'm shorting Duo just a little bit, because so many birds are less than a foot tall, but it's a major buff putting him at average strength in the first place because owls can only carry around 8 pounds at maximum. Look, I know that the math is iffy, and yeah, I failed statistics. If the math is that bad to you, ask yourself. Could you do better? That all being said, if you put the two of us in a ring together, it probably will be a close fight at first, but Duo is ultimately going to go out via fifth round knockout. Um, massive spoiler here, but Tony is going to frost all over my flakes. I gotta cut that. If you go onto the actual Frosted Flakes website, Tony's actual height is listed at 6 feet 3 inches tall. I would have assumed he's a little bit taller, but regardless, he's famously shredded beyond belief. When Tony walks into a room, he gives Simba more body dysmorphia than the Instagram Explore page. Tony the Tiger is probably one of the most iconic cereal mascots up there with the likes of the Lucky Charms Leprechaun and the Honey Nut Cheerios Bee. He's been around since the 50s and is the most popular non-Cheerio breakfast cereal in the United States. Frosted Flakes has done over $400 million in revenue just last year. Tony is larger than life and is arguably more popular than even some of the most recognizable faces in pop culture today. His sheer longevity and mass adoption within the American breakfast culture completely changed the course for cereal brands, and he's still one of the top dogs in the business. With this popularity though comes some interesting side effects. I saw way too many non-work appropriate Google images of Tony the Tiger that would make any person question if they have a genuine thing for furries. When it comes to fighting him in hand-to-hand -hand combat though, that's a different story. It's pretty safe to say that I would understandably sh a brick the moment I step into the ring with Tony. Not because of the furry thing, but because he's big and he's a tiger. The only thing I have going for myself is the fact that he's pretty small compared to the length of the average Bengal tiger. Aside from that, my chances are as close to zero as humanly possible. This 2002 Frosted Flakes commercial you're watching shows Tony kicking a soccer ball with so much force, it reaches the moon and back within about 3 seconds. Light itself takes about 2.5 seconds to reach the moon and reflect back to Earth. This is so much unfathomable power that the force production just from Tony's kick would likely have just about as much raw power as the original Death Star. This absolutely screams superhuman strength to me, and with him still technically being one of the largest cats in the world, he's going to be given a max HP set of 384. I may not even show up to the ring for this one. Tony eviscerates me first five seconds via drop kick. <laughs> Okay. I don't know why I added this to the script, but I'm gonna run with it. I'm gonna definitely run with it. The Gerber baby has the most history out of any of the mascots we're gonna mention today. Originating as a charcoal sketch of a five-month-old back in 1927, this face has been plastered across billions of baby products, 
only to have Destiny allow it to be curb stomped today by me. You think I'm gonna have mercy? on a baby? No, we must be objective regardless of what society and ethics has to say. The reality is that this weak little falls at the very bottom of the HP category with only 25 hit points to its name. If we can have an open dialogue about how Tony the Tiger would absolutely butter me up and smack me into the shadow realm, we can also talk about how the Gerber baby formulaically does not stand a chance against me. It has no agility to defend attacks and is so weak it can't even walk. I will admit this is not a fair fight by any means, but I would easily win this in the first round via spinning back fist. I'd like to think that Mr. Clean has a storied past with lots of intrigue and mystery. What exactly causes a bald white man to choose to live out his days wearing only white shirts and white pants? The world may never know. It wasn't until the late 60s that men wearing earrings was considered normal. However, commercials as early as 1958 depict Mr. Clean sporting the same iconic hoop earring we see today. Pretty cool to see Mr. Clean was such a trendsetter and redefine gender norms even before voting rights were a thing. Get up, cock stuff, it it's almost ironic that a cleaning company got dibs on one of the more attractive mascots in branding history. A dirty household and an even filthier mind both seem to be a pretty common and fitting space for Mr. Clean to take up residence. Those baby blue eyes won't distract me for long though because I'm a little more concerned with how I'd face up against this very large and clean man. Mr. Clean falls into the human typing and is certainly more jacked than I am. I've watched enough commercials to reasonably assume he's about 6 foot 3 and maybe 210 pounds. None of which is body fat, it's all pure muscle and magic erasers. That's going to give Mr. Clean approximately 362 HP and put me in an absolutely terrible spot just from the sheer fact he's going to be multiple weight classes above me. While I might be able to distract him by tugging on his earring for a bit, he ultimately would erase me from existence and likely knock me out with a single headbutt from that smooth and shiny head. Now this is the main event of the evening. This is my Roman Empire. I've waited for this moment for nearly 20 years, and the time is now here to find out just how capable Captain Crunch is at enacting violence. Commercials from the 70s depict Captain Crunch as a stout Navy captain loosely based on fiction novels and Navy personnel from the 1800s. The product itself was named Captain Crunch because the blend of ingredients that make this cereal actually allow it to stay crunchy for longer once you add milk to your bowl of cereal. Captain Crunch's Crunch Berry is also one of the biggest breakfast foods hit with the wave of inflation that we've all been collecting actively experiencing. A study was done tracking the pricing of cereal bundles on Amazon show that the price of crunch berries was inflated over 110% from the beginning of 2022 to 2023. And honestly, this just feels like more fuel to the fire to kick his ass even more. Most of the resources and commercials I've seen of Captain Crunch show that he's pretty stout and prefers clever tactics over raw combat skills. If we take off the captain's hat, we're looking at a glorified short king at about 5 foot 5 with pretty average strength. I've watched enough 90s commercials of Captain Crunch to know that there isn't some larger than life version of him that could potentially show up to a fight. If my calculations serve me correctly, Captain Crunch is gonna be stuck with a mere 108 HP. It's definitely less than I would have expected, but who would have thought that the reason Captain Crunch was waving farewell in heaven was all because I was the man who sent him up there. Did you think we were really done with this project? At the end of the day, it does not matter how I would fare against any of these mascots. What matters is figuring out who is unbeatable. Who is the undisputed champion of this theoretical playing field? What are they capable of? Where is the most coveted and unbeatable character located? Let's look back at the data. The highest max HP from our set of typings comes from the fish category with a cap of 544 HP thanks to our buddy Waylord. I've searched far and wide to see if there were any foreign breakfast foods, brands, or sports teams that had a fish of some sort as the face of their brand. I was met with no luck. Swedish Fish, Finding Nemo, and even Baby Shark were all too weak. But then a thought occurred to me. What if the strongest mascot isn't the face of a brand, but something hiding in plain sight? Something, someone, who isn't standing in the spotlight because they aren't the star of the show. My search finally took me under the sea, and I found my answer. I found my whale. Pearl Krabs is the daughter of Mr. Krabs and is technically a cartoon sperm whale, one of the largest creatures to exist on planet Earth and certainly at the top of the spectrum when it comes to the sizing of all fish-related creatures. There are a few episodes of SpongeBob where Pearl's true strength is depicted, but what we do know for certain is that Pearl is synonymous with destruction. 
In this episode of SpongeBob, the Earth begins to shake just from her crying over a prom date. To cause a visible shaking of this magnitude, I'm gonna assume this probably registered at a 4.5 on the Richter scale. Earthquakes of that size have the power equivalent to detonating 100 tons of TNT, and to our luck, there's an actual documentation of what happens when you blow up that exact amount of explosives. Before the infamous Trinity test occurred in 1945, a baseline was needed to discover just how powerful an explosion could be. A team directed by physicist Kenneth Bainbridge made a cube of 100 tons of TNT and blew it up, marking a notable checkpoint in the nuclear arms race for the United States, and soon after the first nuclear bomb was born. The point of me explaining that to you is that this is how strong this whale is. It's what makes her without a doubt, in my mind, the most destructive and yet most powerful character ever created. She's not going to be on the front of a cereal box or the logo for an app, but she's still there, seemingly unaware of the power that she possesses. She certainly will be at her 544 HP cap and without a doubt would destroy any other mascot thrown in her way. If you can find another mascot that could challenge this theory, be my guest. I know the system is not perfect, but I was not trying to make it perfect by any means. It gave me a fair playing field without creating something too weak or too overpowered, and it also kept me up way later at night than I would like to admit. I hope you enjoyed the video. Leave a like, uh, subscribe, and drop a comment on another mascot you think I should fight. Hit the bell, and uh, go and make something. I'll see you next time.